Are you struggling with roadblocks as a woman in the challenging and constantly changing world of corporate America? If you feel stuck in your career, you may be holding yourself back and may not even realize it. Prepare to be enlightened by the meaningful discussions here at the No Woman Left Behind podcast. Each week, gather the insight you need to break down those walls of limiting beliefs. Unleash your full potential and unlock the leader within. Listen to raw conversations with corporate women as they share inspiring stories with the purpose of obtaining their dream career and living a truly fulfilling life. Here's your host, Rosie Zielinskas. Hey everyone, welcome back to the No Woman Left Behind podcast show. I'm Rosie Zielinskas, your podcast host. Today's episode is a bonus episode for the How to Negotiate in the Corporate World series. I wasn't sure if I could secure my guest on time, and I did, so I'm super excited. So let me tell you about my guest for today. Katie Donovan is a leading pay equity expert and founder of the consultancy Equal Pay Negotiations, which advises employers, advocates, individuals, and other DEIJ providers. On Equal Pay Day 2012, Katie started the push for salary history bans and for inclusion of pay information in job ads. Both measures are now well established and growing in laws and implementation by employers. Additionally, Katie is a sought after commentator on pay equity and women in business by media, including BBC, NPR, Hollywood Reporter, Boston Business Journal, The Washington Post, Forbes, and more. My conversation with Katie is a conversation that you definitely do not want to miss today. She literally tells you what you need to say if a potential employer asks you what compensation you're looking for. We also talk a lot about uh, women they're not really holding themselves back, but instead they're being pushed back. So I always use the term, you know, women hold themselves back. So we're going to clarify what she's referring to in in that um, situation. We're also going to talk about how managers can change the systemic bias in the corporate world. Now, again, Katie has already been instrumental in the work that she has done because now employers are posting the pay range on job descriptions. So that's one big thing that she was instrumental in doing. And the second thing is employers no longer can ask you for your former salary that you made at your prior employment. And we're going to talk about why that is. And that is critical. Both of those things are so critical to closing that pay gap. I'm so excited to bring this episode to you because Katie is a wealth of knowledge and she is going to share everything she knows with us today. So stay tuned for Katie Donovan. Hey guys, really quick, before we get into today's episode, I just want to remind you that if you go on my website, nowomanleftbehind.com, there are some awesome resources on here. First of all, on the homepage, on the top right hand corner, there is a kickstart your career radio button. And this is the corporate kickstart course. It's about 45 minutes. And if you don't know where to start in your career, that's a great course for you to, to start with. Next, there is a radio button that says, I'm ready for my corner office. If you are at the point where you want to talk to somebody and want to have a consultation with me, you can click on this and it'll take you to my calendar and you will be able to answer a short questionnaire. And you and I can talk for about 30 minutes about where you are versus where you want to be in your career. If you continue to to scroll down on that same page, there is a section that says, let's find out where you are in your career. And there's another radio button that says, take the quiz. This is the corporate kickstart quiz. So it'll take you about 10 minutes to take that quiz, but it'll give you some great information. And if you scroll all the way down on that main page, you will see some additional freebies that you can download, which are the believe in yourself. And this is three steps for women in corporate to stop 
being left behind. So if you click on that learn more button, you can download that one. There's also the conversation starters checklist. And again, you can click on that learn more button to get to download that one. And then finally, the productivity strategies workbook that you can figure out how to be more productive and you can download that one by going to the learn more. So again, these are just some awesome resources that I just wanted to make you aware. And now we are going on to our episode. Katie, thank you so much uh, for being here on the No Woman Left Behind podcast show. Now, Katie, I know that you say that women in the corporate world don't hold themselves back, but instead they are pushed back. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Sure. Thank you for having me, Rose. I really appreciate the chance to have this conversation. Uh, what I'm talking about is the systemic biases throughout almost every industry. There's no industry, there's no country, there, there's no place that there is equality for women in the work world, whether that's being paid equally or being represented appropriately based on their um, representation in the entire workforce in leadership. So we're one, not getting paid correctly. Two, we're not getting promoted at the rate that we should be. We're not getting funded for venture capitalism. We only get 2.4% of all the venture capitalism, which is absolutely mind boggling. Mm -hmm. You know, there's many things and we can't say that all of this is Rosie's problem. Rosie has to go fix herself. Right. Yeah. Um, it is really understanding what may seem just like, oh, a basic norm. And I need to figure a way around it because I'm not meeting the norms of the day to reframing them of, hey, when they created these norms and we're thinking basically of white men because they have de facto become the standard in the work world because women weren't part of it. Um, marginalized people were put into positions that wouldn't be able to be the CEO to start their own firm. And they had to create other ways to do it. You know, so those are the things I'm talking about. And that's where I focus process operations. Mm. You know, how do we make small changes like not asking about salary history, putting pay in job ads that will have huge impact and don't put the emphasis on the victim fixing the problem. Got it. Okay. So that's very clear to me because I always, I do talk about, first of all, knowing your worth and, you know, women holding them, themselves back. And although sometimes that does happen, I like how you made the distinction of we're already starting with a losing battle <laughs> is basically yes. what you're saying, which makes a lot of sense to me. So now I know that you have been working for about 12 years in the pay gap world, and you have actually been instrumental in writing legislation. And as often as I can, I try to tell people, hey, there's these pay transparency laws. And I think last time I checked, there was 17 states that have these pay transparency laws. And I'm so glad that you're here because I know you were instrumental in starting to write some of that legislation. So tell me a little bit about First of all, why did you get into this work and how did you start writing legislation on pay gap? Sure. So I got into this work because I had a dinner too many with a friend, one too many, discovering she was underpaid. Uh, by happenstance, she discovered she was paid 30 grand less than a colleague that she helped train. So, uh, you know. You have those moments and with my background of having been sales and marketing and actually in the staffing industry. So I worked for an applicant tracking company. I worked in a staffing agency. Uh, I worked as a director of a trade association. So I very much knew both sides of hiring, the employer's perspective, the employee's perspective or candidates. And I knew way too much detail about the actual hiring process and every line on every application, because that was part of when I was in the um, applicant tracking company, working with the employers. And we had everything from mom and pop to international. So consistently, the second thing after your name is, what are you looking to earn? 
You know, like Mm -hmm. I knew that it was embedded in me in my blood. (laughs) You know, like I didn't have to think about it. So I knew these things and I just said, you know what, I'll start doing some consulting on the side, maybe teach a couple of community classes at the little local gym kind of thing. And that's how I started. But very quickly, um, just adding that into my LinkedIn, I got reached out to by a director of a um, documentary. It never got released, but in the question and answer interview, she asked me if you could write legislature or policy, what would it be? And I knew because I knew those job applications (laughs) so darn well that it had to be getting rid of the question, what are you looking to earn? Because that has nothing to do with it. It's what's the value of the job? You know, I I may need a thousand dollars to pay the rent and have food and whatnot, but if the job should pay three thousand dollars, that's what I should get paid. Yeah. So that killed me. So I knew that was part of it. And to get rid of that, also the salary history question, it would be like, okay, Rosie, so what's your job today? And what are you making today? And what were you making at your last job? So they knew you what you were used to getting jumped at. So, oh, Rosie is comfortable getting a five to a five percent increase. That's what we'll offer her. Oh, Rosie needs a ten percent in- increase. That's what we'll offer her. Again, regardless of the job, should pay three thousand. Rosie will be happy with fifteen hundred because that is what we see based on her history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I knew those answers. I answered it. And then I went and did research because I really wasn't thinking policy at all in doing my little workshops um, and discovered no one was talking about either of those things. It just they weren't part of the conversation. The word pay transparency was, um, but it was in, in, in about talking that I could tell you my pay and you could tell me your pay and neither one of us would get fired. Right. I mean, I myself had signed a few of those pay confidentiality agreements in my lifetime. And the fact that you can get fired is the definition of, oh, I'm getting underpaid. Like just the sheer fact that they had you sign that, you should know there's a problem. Um, So they were, again, focusing on the victim. And I just, uh, no, let's focus on the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. It's not the victim's problem to fix. Exactly. And so the policy that you started to write, what what state was that for, by the way? So my home state is Massachusetts. I started the process on Equal Pay Day 2012 by writing a change.org pe- petition. Let's throw this out there. It had those two um, instances, aspects, and then it had two other aspects of uh, no credit card check or credit background check. And what was the other? I forget even what the other is. Okay, <laughs> It's something that's out there now already included. Like it's already covered. Okay. Um, so I started there and got a little coverage, actually got some press coverage where you're crazy. It's never going to happen. There's no way jobs will ever, ha- advertisements will ever have pay in them. I don't know who this lady is. It's like, Yay. <laughs> now we're on to a fight. <laughs> um, and then doing policy work, you have to create coalitions. I knew that I, I come from a family with politicians, so I had ability to find out just from growing up at the kitchen table, but also from asking people, I, I was able to know what I needed to do. Um, and so the first couple of years I would be talking about this, writing about it, doing like Huffington Post things and whatnot. But it really was about creating a coalition. Um, And how that starts is me first joining their efforts, getting to know the people working in women's equality at work. And hooked up with Mass Now and AAUW, 2020 Women on Boards, like just a bunch of different groups. It was through Mass Now, which is the Massachusetts chapter of uh, National Organization for Women, that I um, was working or volunteering on their legislative workforce and was able to get them to buy in that, yes, they would be the nonprofit that supports this bill. Because there's no politician who will ever sign a bill or file a bill based on, you know, Katie says. (laughs) You you have to have an organization and that organization has to have a ton of other organizations 
Um, so we were able to get um, sponsors for the bill, both in the House and the Senate. Then we actually merged with another bill that was being filed that same year. So this was for the 2015 legislature work being done in 2014. Um, we we um, partnered with the Women's Law Association. And I, I know I'm screwing that up. Um, <laughs> but it was a Women's Law Association. Um, Bar Association, that's it. <laughs> the Women's Bar Association. And we merged their thoughts and our thoughts and created a bill, had uh, our four sponsors all uh, file the bill. We had amazing support from the very beginning. It actually had been a lot of history in Massachusetts working towards some change in our state Equal Pay Act. Um, so this just built on that smaller momentum. We really had a, a foundation, but it wasn't very big. And we really made it much bigger. And we were successful in getting it passed in the first legislative session, which is really unique. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's um, and a credit to all the groups coming together. And the person who was leading the group, Jill Ashton, she's amazing at bringing coalitions together. Um, and really making headway. So in the bill that passed into law, the salary history ban stayed in. The pay in job advertisements died a terrible death. But part of this process had us also talking to all these other states and everyone everyone kind of talks to each other working on policy work. And then we had huge coverage of it, uh, front page on the New York Times, like just a lot of stuff. So people were coming to us. What are you doing? How do we do the same? Mm -hmm. And our advice was, hey, what's on the news is the salary history ban, but you need to do both salary history ban and no pay and, and the pay and job ads. And we knew one of them would eventually be successful on the pay part. Mm -hmm. So we have over 50 um Oh, it must be much higher now. I haven't counted in a while, but it's over over 50 actual laws or executive orders banning uh, questions about your previous pay. And then now we have, um, as of this week, California and Washington State are newly added to requiring pay and job advertisements. New York State right before the end of last year. So yeah. I think it was like December 29th. Um, signed into law and it will go into effect in September that they have to have pay and job advertisements. New York City already had it go into effect. Mm -hmm. So between New York City, California, and Washington, we really have, um, with the big tech finances companies and just financial of New York City and like just so many different groups, it's probably about 20% of employers are already covered. <laughs> Yeah. that are requiring it. And once they have to do something like that, it's easier to just do it across the board. Yeah. Um, so we'll see, we're seeing employers doing it on their own as well, regardless of if it's required. The other part is with remote work, employers are doing it because they want to make sure they are encouraging other people from those states to come as well. Right. Wow. Well, you said a lot there. Well, first of all, the very first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you, oh. Katie, for taking this endeavor, because if you had not done it and, and thought about writing policy, we probably wouldn't have any of this stuff. And I myself have already seen jobs posted in New York specifically that have the, the pay range right on the job posting. So your work and all of the people's work that was involved is already paying off because it makes such a huge difference uh, to have that pay range because it goes back to this is what the job is paying, not the one person that, like you said, they were only earning, you know, so-and-so. I think this is absolutely incredible because it will help not just women, but any individual, you know, minority that is not, you know, getting paid commensurate to the job description. And, you know, my hope and your hope obviously is that 
at some point in history, we women and minorities will be equal to males. And this is just one major step in the right direction. I do know Iceland is really good about, is a, is a good country with uh, their just pay uh, gap, uh, pay gap and then gender gap just in general. They do a really good job at trying to empower women and try to treat them as best as possible. But I think it's still only like 91%. So <laughs> Right. It's definitely better. It's been improving. There's different countries trying different things. Some require reporting some actually give um, penalties, oh. <laughs> you, you know, like it, it's at the end of the day, if it if they can get away with it and it's cheaper to not do it, then it's not going to get done. Right. <laughs> you know, we have to make it worth doing. Right. I think. And so, so Katie, from your perspective, um, what is, has there been any pushback from employers to do this this kind of pay transparency and the job postings for new hires? Well, I, part of me wants to say to find pushback, but yes, there's pushback in the sense that, um, you know, it's, it wasn't like, oh, can you include your pay in job advertisements? Oh, sure, no problem. Right. Uh, we, we forgot, oh, silly us. Uh, you know, there was pushback from day one and there's a million reasons that they'll quote. Um, one of the classic ones I remember sitting in many different legislators' offices. Well, what about if you know I, I'm interviewing Rosie for the director level, and I think she she's not quite right, but I want to give her a chance. And instead of bringing in as a director, I'll bring her in as assistant director. Do I have to pay her that amount? Well, the part of me that laughed internally is, oh, you just described another absolute prejudice that goes against women. We may be the best candidate out of the 200 people who applied, but you're going to find a reason to give us a lower title and lower pay. And I've had many clients in my work do that. Like I know way too many stories of that and they don't even think of it. So that's one of them. They're trying to figure out if we put the pay, we, we get, we lose the chance to um, come in lower if we have the opportunity. They don't always talk about that, the employers. And I, I want to put in a little kind of caveat here of like, mm -hmm. this is because you're used to it. I'm not thinking anyone's a bad actor in the sense of I am an HR recruiter and I'm about to kill Rosie. You right. know, like I'm not trying to, I know that's not what's going on through your head or the VP or the CEO. But I know staffing is the most expensive cost for most employers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every penny saved helps immensely. But whatever you're doing to get an advantage has to have the same impact for everyone. Right. And that's not the case. So if you go and look at how many people got hired at a lower title or a lower pay, you're going to see it's usually not the white men. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's the issue. So that's the kind of pushback. They're so used to doing things a certain way. They can't understand it. We got the pushback for the salary history being, you know, how dare you? How will we figure out what to pay them? Well, long before a job is a job, you have to get it approved and budgeted. You know who what you're paying. You just don't know who you're paying it to. So that's, but they're so used to adding 10%. Now they're past that, or at least about 50% of the countries past that, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it's getting them used to new things. The, the pushback is our systems isn't created that way. Right. And to your point, it's, this is a new paradigm that we're trying to break out of, right? Because as you just said, the corporate world or business in general is just so used to, pardon my expression, but shitting on women and minorities <laughs> that, you know, it's just, they're trying to get an, a, a person that does a really good job at a bargain price. Yes. And that's not fair to, to us human beings that are just as capable as 
the white males that do that job. And, you know, neither Katie nor I hate on white males. We're not saying that they're, you know, we're not man haters or anything like that, but we are saying that we women and minorities should be treated in the exact same way. That's what we're saying. And I, I, I want to say yes. And I think most people who are treating people differently don't realize it. So that's why I kind of stutter there a little in the sense that most people won't think of themselves as being biased or doing anything wrong to you or me or whatever. You know, you had the chance to fix it and you just didn't come up with the right argument. For example, like there's tons of research showing that women are attempting to negotiate raises just as frequently as men, Mm -hmm. but men get the approvals and women don't. It's a very different metric. So what's going on in those rooms? And you can't tell me every single woman is an idiot about negotiating. Right. Exactly. So that that's where it's like, we need to create operations for even the littlest thing. What's the answer when someone comes in and asks for a race? It should be why and make sure whatever your checklist is you know if everyone if if the answer first is going to be no just because that's your going to be your way of um, engaging great but it needs to be no for everyone and then the ones who come back with another response you can move forward or if it's yes then it's a one percent it needs to be one percent across the board like you need to have an operations that's not my mood that day or right. how someone feels. Cause for whatever reason, the knee jerk reaction is we women are just being jerks. Yeah. 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 No, I, I get that. So what I'm hearing you say is that we need to approach the systemic biases that have always been there that people may not even know that they're doing it because it's just the way it's always been. And what you're trying to do is break through all of those biases and at the very least uh, expose them, uh, educate people to become aware of those biases. You know, again, they may or may not know, but once they know, then there's no excuse. (laughs) Exactly. Correct. So awareness is the one of the biggest things that you're trying to do. And again, I think that's fantastic. Now, interestingly enough, uh, again, you know, the states that I had researched that have the pay transparency laws, some of them do list the pay range right on the on the job description, but other states won't list it. But if you request it, they will give it to you. So it depends on the state if they're actually going to print it or not. So if you are interested in having this conversation with your employer, go look at the pay transparency laws to see what your state is doing. And then you're educated on whether you can request the information or not. You don't need a law to request the information. <laughs> Let's start there. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, so the states that started or even the counties, uh, some of them were local regional things. Um, that started with, if you are asked, you have to respond. That was California. And that was the first kink, chink in the whole moving forward. So it really is, those will be gone. Given another few years. And the ones who started with that, they got what they could. And they will get to, since we now have hit a tipping point, they will get to your pay is in the job app. Got it. Um I would ask, even before any of these laws, it is amazing, probably 80% answer anyway. So if they ask you, hey, Rosie, what are you looking to earn? Say, oh, well, I'm assuming you have it budgeted. What are you budgeted for? Mm. That's the conversation. I Okay, I'm going to ask you to say that again, because I think that's really important. So let's say that again. Okay, so you're in an interview and it's like, hey, Rosie. So I don't waste your time. You don't waste mine. How much are you looking to earn? And instead of saying, oh, I don't know, or you know, whatever, say, I know, I'm assuming you've budgeted this before you even opened up the job. Can you tell me what it's been budgeted for? Yeah. It does two things. One, if you said the exact same number that they are about to say, you saying it, it became the ceiling. 
they're going to give you an offer that's lower than that. Right. <laughs> if they say it, it becomes the floor. Mm. Now you know that's the bare minimum they're willing to say, and they have at least one penny more or a million more. We don't know where. Now the game is to figure out what more, but that's the floor. Know that. Also, there's research that if you bring up pay, so like there's no, no information on any job ad, you can't figure it out, um, do not for your dear life, do not be the one that brings up how much does this pay because you instantly get viewed as a worse candidate. Mm. Wow. So just, just hold your breath until the time is when you have power because you won't have power anyway till you get the job offer. So don't try to negotiate it till you actually have a reason to. That's a That's great. So what you just said as far as if they ask you what you're looking to earn and you kind of turn it back on them and say, well, what is the, the range, the pay range that you have already budgeted? That's gold right there, Katie. That's like the whole podcast is like right there today <laughs> yeah. because it's huge. And I think so many people are, are kind of stuck in that, in that, well, what do I say if they, um, if they try to pin me down and, you know, so I think what, yeah, that, that was just fantastic what you just said. Yeah, well, and it's not about talking about any law. There's laws to protect you, but your interview should not be about you trying to say all the laws that are protecting you. Mm -hmm. Your interview is you marketing yourself as an amazing candidate. Right. That's it. Absolutely. I love that. Now, what are some of the things that you're working on from the policy that you're, you know, just the knowledge of policy or, or any other things that are like maybe coming down the pike as far as a pay gap? Well, now that it's been um, a little over 10 years for the salary history being and the transparency stuff, and I'm kind of feeling like a grandmother seeing the next generation moving forward. They don't really, <laughs> I, I haven't been that as involved in it in a while, which is a good thing. It means it has a life of its own and I can mm -hmm. look at other things. Um, the next thing that I see happening in the next 10 years, and it is going to be right now, I am a lone voice again, and it is going to be a 10 year battle. I don't see it being quicker. It would be nice is that we act like the median of everyone actually is a good thing, <laughs> but let's do the fifth grade math. We all learned <laughs> If you have a group of one group that's a lower number and another group that's a higher number and try to get the average of them too, it's going to be in between those two. So there's white men and I, I, I say them, I could use the word the standard. Either one is they're interchangeable. So okay. there's the standard that every pay gap is a difference between the median of men or the median of white people or the median of whatever we're comparing against. There's a difference between that and the median of whatever marginalized group we're comparing. So somehow in our weird little mathematically challenged world, we decided median of everyone fixes it, but it's not even close to what the median of the standard is. Mm. So if I'm making... 80k and you're making 100k the average or the median would be 90 mm -hmm. so if i'm saying i'm going to offer you 90 i as the person making 80 will be like oh that's great i got an increase you as the person already making 100 would go like okay well you need to give me 110 because that's just bs right and that's what the and that's why men get their raises because that's what they're able to say well we women have a different experience and we're like oh they threw us a little crumb and it seems so much better but it's still miles from what the men are earning mm -hmm. so my next thing is that we actually have i've been calling it the white men's database but we need to have an actual real-time like you know, like how when you go on the internet, I'm not going to name any specific brand, but you can go do um, salary research on a bunch of different locations, a bunch of different job boards. And they all will say, you know, as of the end of last month or as of whatever date, the median and the, the minimum and the max, and they have all different numbers of everyone. 
is X. And you can cut and paste it by education and location, years of experience, but not by gender, not by race. Mm -hmm. Those you got to wait a year and a half from now when the government shows it to you. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's meaningless. Right. We need instant. We need that. And companies need to be, if you're using median as what you're focusing on, you need to kick it up because you're not closing any pay gap, no matter how much DEIJ, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice work you're doing, you are by accepting median as a good number, are killing every other effort you're doing. Oh my gosh. I mean, I feel a little disheartened, you know, hearing that, but on the, on the other hand, I feel more empowered knowing that you're working on it and that it's being brought up as a major issue that we're going to have. And hopefully, like you said, in the next 10 years, I think you said, yeah, <laughs> be... I do things in decades, <laughs> but, but you know you... what? You do them big, Katie, you do them, big. <laughs> <laughs> but you as a, and meaning you Rosie and you and your listeners, you as an individual, now that you know that yourself, as you're determining, what should I be getting paid this year at the work I'm doing now? If, if you're making approximately median, you're well underpaid. Mm. Go have that conversation with your boss. Hey, I just realized blah, blah, blah. And we have on page one of the handbook, on page 22 of the handbook, on page seven on the website, all this information about how we in equity play. By definition, I'm being underpaid. Go have that conversation. They're not going to give it to you that day. It is going to be a long, multiple conversation, but start it. You right. can do that. Yes. And then when you're applying for jobs, Aim for 75% or higher as what you want to get paid because that's where the white guys are hanging. That is so you're saying 75% of the of the pay range for that job, 75% of that, that's where the that's yeah. where the white guys are hanging out. Okay. That, that's yeah. great information, Katie. That's great information. Now, where do you I, I know you said um, earlier that you you have done workshops and stuff like that. Where do you personally deliver or showcase this information that you're working on other than policy? So I have a consultancy called Equal Pay Negotiations at equalpaynegotiations.com. Okay. Um, I tend not to have my own workshops. I do workshops for others. So groups will come eat, have me come in and do workshops. I do um, colleges, nonprofits, trade associations, any any organization, companies, employers doing it for their um, management, um, HR. I've done it for HR groups. So any group like that. And so, then I do individual consulting as well. Got it. And so how long are typically your workshops that when you deliver these workshops? It typically um, is somewhere between an hour and two type of Thing, depending on what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, as you were saying before, I think to me, I've been doing this so long. <laughs> I could go on for two days, but yeah. you know, um, you really want to do it small by size, what's manageable. You don't want to blow people's minds away too much. Um, if it is something with management and people in power, I do like to get it to be longer because you really want them to ha have action at the end of it, because their action is more important than our action as individuals. If it is with individuals, those tend to be, you know, like I'm doing it for women engineers group um, in the next month. And like, that is more of, you know, an hour type of thing. You want it manageable and not depressing them of all the many things that they're sure. going to see in the world. <laughs> <laughs> now you said something very key. Managers are the ones that can impact uh, the workplace more than an individual. What are some things that you talk about in your workshops to managers that they can actually work on? Maybe like two or three things that you can, you know, talk about. So the beauty part of us women are we're not only victims, but we also are perpetrators when we follow the corporate rules and rights. Uh, so mm. we do have, so we do have some power, you know, you can become the squeaky wheel at work. And whenever you have a new opening question, you, sh you should have questions for HR. Did, is this range the median? Cause I'm not going to offer the median. Just make it as a statement. Don't make it as a question. 
make them figure out how to work with you, not you how to work with them. Hmm. Um, I, I want the pay in my job advertisements to be included. Again, make it a statement, regardless of what state you live in. You know, you now know this is important. You want to have it. Let them fight with you. Why not? And right. you just say, well, and instead of fighting with the recruiter, because they have as much power as you, you're both probably feeling powerless in this conversation. But you as the manager, the hiring manager, regardless of what your title is, you can say, great, I get that this is a process. I am willing and able to do this process for however it longs, whether it, it, it takes effect for this job or a job I have a year from now, we're going to do it. So let's figure out what the process is. And now it takes it away from you being my enemy and we're working together at the same goal. Who needs to get involved in this conversation and how, what do we need to provide and can we do it? But I'm never giving it up. Good. Every hire I have, I'm going to be asking these same questions and I'm going to be looking for these same things. Yeah. And there's more than enough data out there nowadays. Um, and the other thing is you don't any, need anyone's permission to in the, in the interview say, Hey, by the way, this job pays 50 grand. End of story. Mm -hmm. They need to be advertised. You just fixed it. Absolutely. Holy cow. <laughs> so do that. <laughs> that is key information. Like you said, it, and you're absolutely right. You know, we're not only the victims, but we are the perpetrators because we keep the same dynamic going over and over and over. And, uh, so, but those are fantastic, actionable things that people as managers can do that will impact not just one individual, but the jobs of all of those similar, uh, you know, people coming in. So I think that that is fabulous. Wow. Um, I think my mind is just like blown away with all the great, amazing information that you have provided. Now, is there anything else that you think that we need to touch, you know, based on, because again, you're the expert here as far as pay transparency loss. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you that maybe you want to um, share with us at this point? Uh, with your viewers, I think the thing, the, the big advice I have for everyone is it's all fixable. It can feel overwhelming. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. Don't make it personal though. Whatever you're experiencing is probably has been experienced by a million women before you and a million women after you. Mm -hmm. um, think of it as objectively as you can. And that can be whether it's you trying to negotiate your own raise or your new salary. Instead of talking about, I'm great, make it objective, very objective. So it's, here's what I did. And not that I, one of my favorite examples is um, I had a VP of some of finance once as a client and she kept talking about PowerPoint. Like this is the biggest thing she ever did in her world. And I was like, what the heck is going on here? And after pulling and pulling and pulling, it was, well, she used PowerPoint in the meetings that she presented to the board of directors to get millions and millions and millions of dollars, you know, allocated for different things. And I'm like, oh, sweetheart, we're missing the point. <laughs> you know, like, and, and I think all of us are so focused on our day to day because it's what we, what we lived, what we experienced, what we can talk about without thinking. I did PowerPoint for four hours. No, you got $4 million to introduce Absolutely. a new program. Absolutely. So, so that's where we have to change our mindset of objective. And if you're talking tasks, stop it. Talk impact. Your resume, your cover letters, your LinkedIn profile, your whatever. Or, or what you want for your new job. Don't talk about what the task is you want to do. What's the impact you want? I love it. I think that that's a perfect segue. So you are like this episode that we're recording. This is the last uh, episode in the negotiation series that I have done. And once we're finished with this one, we're going to segue into storytelling, which what you just said is basically take that information, tell the story. It's not the PowerPoint. It's the four million dollars. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> 
And so we're going to do, I'm probably going to do three or four episodes on storytelling. Once you have all your ducks in a row, now how do you actually take that information and you convert it into a beautiful story that you can share with your manager to get that, you know, pay or whatever job that, that you're looking for. So I think this is all working out really beautifully. And, and again, you provided us so much great information. And do you have any uh, maybe two actionable tips that you would want to share with the listeners that they can actually implement? Yes. Um, first one is every year do a health care on your job. Just like going to the doctor is a little check-in. Am I getting paid appropriately? Am I doing what I want? Am I moving to my ultimate career goal? Because most of us wait till we hate our job before we look for the next one. You're just being human. Don't worry about it. You're, you're doing nothing wrong, but stop it. Yes. You have you have to make it, you know, whatever, at the end of the year, the September, whatever you want. When's your checkout, your checkup? And go do what you need to get to the next step. Because none of us want the same job at 60 that we had at 22. Right. That's that awesome. would be the one big thing I would do. All right. Sounds perfect. All right, Katie. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I mean, literally, this is probably one of the most valuable episodes that I've done in this in this negotiation series because you provided us some very tangible things that we can do that nobody's talking about this, Katie. You know, nobody's talking yeah. about it, which is which is, you know, kind of why I start I wanted to do the negotiation series. And I'm just so blessed and grateful that you accepted my LinkedIn invite and we were able to connect and this has been amazing. So thank you for your time. And uh, for all those listeners, please follow all of Katie's advice. I really do hope that you got some tremendous value from not only this series, but this episode specifically, because Katie provided us such concrete information on what you can do when an employer, for example, is asking you how much you want to make for a potential job, or if you're looking to get a salary increase where your target should be. And those two pieces of information right there are just pure gold. Everything that Katie is doing is so appreciated because again, she has paved the way for so many of us and the work that she continues to do is just going to continue to help those coming up behind us. The tip that Katie shared with us today is just one today. She said, do a healthcare check on your job. Don't wait until you're hating your job to figure out what you want. So she provides three questions that you want to ask yourself. The first one is, am I getting paid appropriately? Am I doing what I want? And the last one is, am I moving towards the ultimate career goal that I want? So those are the three questions that you really need to be asking yourself when you're doing a healthcare check. And she also recommends that you should do this healthcare check on your job every year. That's why she says, don't wait until you hate your job. If you do it every year and you're checking in with yourself, then you're not going to get to that place where you're hating your job. I really do hope that you found tremendous value, again, with not just this episode, but th with this series. This is a labor of love for me because I wanted to provide all of you listeners as much information on what you could do to get to know your worth when it comes to how do you show your value with the things that you have done and your skills and all that stuff. And as I promised in the past, there is going to be a document that you can download that will give you the process of all the specific items that you need to do whenever you're preparing for the negotiation conversation. Now that you've done all the work with the knowing your worth, now we're going to segue into storytelling. How do you tell your story? What are the steps that you need to do to tell your story? How do you tell your story in a precise and concise way? So we're going to kick off a storytelling series and it's just going to flow with how now do you tell your story to the employer when you're talking to them? And I'm really excited about that. If you have any 
questions on any of this, or if you have any other topics that you want me to cover, please, by all means, send me an email. Remember to go to my website, nowomanleftbehind.com. That will have the podcast episodes and Katie's episode will have all of her contact information, which is her website, her Instagram, and her LinkedIn. So all of Katie's information will be right on the episode uh, website. I hope that you have a great rest of your day and always remember to be brave, be bold, and take action. Thank you for listening to this episode. Let these stories of self-encouragement and professional development serve as a guide in navigating through corporate America in the most practical and fulfilling way possible. Do not forget to subscribe to the show at nowomanleftbehind.com for more content like this. Leave a rating and share it with your friends because we want to make sure that no woman is left behind. Until I see you next time, remember to be brave, be bold, and take action.